welcome to Washington State, the second most populous state on the West Coast and in the Western United States after California. Did you know that Washington is the only state named after a president? It was nicknamed the Evergreen State by C.T. Conover, pioneer Seattle realtor and historian for its abundant evergreen forests. It's also the birthplace of Bob Barker, Ray Charles, Bill Gates, Jimi Hendrix, Adam West, and Wesley Allen Dodd. While the first five names on this list will likely ring a bell, you may be a little bit confused about the last person we mentioned, but don't worry, this isn't a general knowledge quiz. We don't blame you if you've never heard of Wesley Allen Dodd, and to be honest, many people wish he never existed. Why are we being so harsh? Stick around and you'll find out. Wesley Allen Dodd was born on July 3, 1961 in Richland, Washington. Some of you may be familiar with the town of Richland, a popular spot of stand-up paddleboarding, an oasis of culture regarding the Tri-Cities area, and a place where you can find the Goose Ridge Estate Vineyard and Winery for an out-of-this-world wine-tasting experience. But the town also gave birth to a very dangerous predator. Dodd grew up in a loveless environment and was frequently overlooked by his parents in favour of his two younger siblings. He also said that he was bullied in school and that he was denied or disallowed emotional growth. Dodd was aware of his sexual attraction to neighbourhood boys when he was about nine years old. Six years later, his parents would split up and this created chaos in the household. He began to dabble in exhibitionism at the age of 13. Dodd would flash other children from his bedroom window until one of them reported him and the cops were called. Dodd got off easy that time because the witness didn't see his face, but the ordeal taught him to seek pleasure elsewhere. He quickly progressed from exposing himself to more violent activities, getting physical with any kid who would comply. Dodd took his performance on the road and rode his bike around the neighbourhood seeking kids aged 10 and under. He'd ride by, shout at them, and then reveal himself once they were paying attention. Boys didn't report me as often as girls, he stated, so he went looking for them. Dodd claimed he started exposing himself since he had reached puberty and had not been taught about sex. He never claimed to have been sexually assaulted as a child, Instead, blaming his misery on his parents' frequent arguing and lack of emotional support as a child. Despite Wesley's escalating arrests and warnings, his father, Jim Dodd, told the Oregonian that he recognised his son's sexual deviancy through father-son conversations, but mainly avoided talking about it. Paedophilia is one of the behaviours linked with loners who have poor self-esteem according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which defines and characterizes mental illnesses. They're sexually insecure and fear rejection from their peers. They fail to develop because they shun adult connections. Dodd stated that he was socially isolated and that girls intimidated him. While his peers had begun dating and attending high school dances, Dodd sat at home plotting ways to initiate sexual behaviour with minors. Dodd, like other child molesters, abused the confidence of youngsters in his care. Stranger kidnappings are typically used as a final resort. If a sexual predator has access to children who know and trust them, he will exploit that trust. Dodd's cousins were his first victims. He abused his own eight-year-old cousin in a closet at the age of 14 her six-year-old brother the next day, and another male relative a few weeks later. Dodd abused the children of a woman Dodd's father was also dating. As I said, his first victims were his own cousins. Dodd would put himself in settings where he would be among kids when his cousins weren't accessible. He made friends with the local lads and offered to babysit. Dodd was invited to stand in for a neighbour's regular babysitter when he was 16, 
and he assaulted the kids while they slept. Dodd then pursued employment that required him to interact with children, such as working as a camp counsellor. He didn't use force on his victims until much later. Dodd used fun and games to entice youngsters into improper contact. He encouraged youngsters to go about nude and proposed activities like spin the bottle, strip poker, skinny dipping, and truth or dare as party games. He took advantage of children's naive curiosity and disguised the abuse as harmless fun. I've done this to other kids before and they enjoyed it, he'd remark. He played on their fear and apprehension, as well as their guilt at having done something bad. Dodd tried to normalise the situation for little children who didn't know any difference. He attempted to persuade a befuddled youngster that he was teaching him a pleasant activity that grown-ups perform and that it was totally normal. Dodd's fantasies became increasingly violent over the years and he even wrote about wanting to eat the genitals of his victims. Now that's one disgusting choice when it comes to an afternoon lunch. The arrests had no effect on him. Dodd had been detained for exposing himself at the age of 15, but he had not been prosecuted. Instead, the authorities suggested that he sought therapy. Throughout the years, Dodd would attend court-ordered therapy sessions on an irregular basis, if at all. The arrest piled up, but Dodd was not punished with the appropriate jail time. Dodd, now 18 and anxious for fresh victims, after the youngsters he had been abusing on a regular basis moved away, now went after kids he didn't know. He found that he could be more aggressive with youngsters than he had first thought. He came upon a little child fishing alone in a forested location in one similar occurrence. He asked whether the child would want to see something, quote, very nice, end quote. Dodd then forced the youngster to strip once they were separated, but they were interrupted by another group of children, which was very lucky for the boy. Dodd joined the US Navy two years later, in part to avoid pending charges of child molestation. If I hadn't joined the Navy then, I may have been killing within a year, said Dodd. Weeks before enlisting in September of 1981, Dodd attempted to abduct a couple of little girls, and although they reported him to the police, Dodd wasn't incarcerated. Dodd was stationed at a submarine base in Bangor, Washington. Even though he was on duty, he would still prey on the children who lived on the base. He also made excursions to Seattle, where he approached kids in movie theatre bathrooms. Dodd began to use money as a lure, tricking children into going into secluded areas to help him supposedly get something. Once they were alone, David would order the child to pull down their pants. He learned that the arcade was a perfect place to find kids who needed more money, so that they could spend it on games and win prizes. He gave them quarters for each of his demands. At one point he was arrested, offering to pay some boys $50 each to go to a motel and play strip poker with him. But after he admitted to police that he planned on molesting them, the charges were mysteriously dropped. Why do you think the police did this? Did they think that admitting to such a horrible act was punishment enough for Dodd? Leave your opinion in the comments. Now let's get back to the story. Eventually, Dodd was arrested and received a general discharge from the Navy. He was apprehended after approaching a young boy and found guilty of attempted indecent liberties. For this, he served 19 days in jail and was ordered, again, to get counselling. Of course, that wasn't going to do him any good. Dodd had one thing on his mind and no amount of counselling would fix that. As time went on, things started getting more and more serious. Not that they weren't before. On December 29, 1982, Dodd was back in jail. This guy got arrested so many times that you'd think he'd get it through his head. But as we'll see, he didn't care one bit. 
On this occasion, he was arrested in Benton City, Washington. He was caught undressing a kid after luring him away from the playground. Dodd was honest, at least he had one good trait if you could call it that, and he pled guilty on that charge in January 1983. He served a total of 30 days in jail before he was released again in order to, you guessed it, seek court-ordered counselling. You'd think these judges would have learned by now. Of course, the so-called treatment was a failure. With the court's permission, Dodd went to live with his father in Lewiston, Idaho, where he signed up for another outpatient program and was said to be making some progress. But Dodd was relentless. No amount of counselling would keep him from pursuing his sick desires. In May 1984, he was arrested for molesting a 10-year-old boy. Although his initial sentence would have kept him off the streets, which would have been the right thing to do, the judge, for reasons unknown, allowed Dodd to stay out of jail by giving him a suspended one-year sentence, providing that he attends counselling and conducts himself as a good citizen. During this period, Dodd was arrested twice for driving with a suspended license, but he was not brought back to jail. What a nice change of pace. I'm kidding. While being out on the streets, Dodd was free to seek out more targets, as he enjoyed calling them. He would not let probation or warrant stop him. Every decision he made involved his access to children. He chose an apartment building with lots of kids and took jobs at fast food restaurants, convenience stores and charity truck routes. His sick mind worked to the extent of coming up with some really elaborate plans. While on his truck routes, he would be invited to houses that happened to have children. Even the act of changing a baby's diapers was enough to arouse Dodd to molestation. If he saw a kid that he liked, he would write down the address with plans to return on another day in his own car, hoping to catch the child alone. On his routes, he would make note of any isolated areas he encountered and mark them on a map. Dodd offered to babysit for free. As a birthday present, he bought a co-worker's kid fishing where he sexually assaulted him. He routinely assaulted a neighbour's two and four year old children, but their mother didn't press charges because she didn't want the boys to be traumatised. Dodd did some unforgivable acts until then, but the true horror started two years later when he gets back in the Vancouver area. Dodd relocated to Seattle in 1986 when he was 25 years old. After sexually assaulting at least 30 children and getting away with it almost scot-free, he felt truly invincible. Quote, When I arrived in Seattle, I realised that a molestation was less likely to be reported than an attempt. I decided to be a little more assertive in the future. I wouldn't take no for an answer to my wishes any longer, Dodd said in his writings. He targeted the most vulnerable kids, including a roommate's two-year-old son, who was partially deaf and couldn't speak yet. Dodd tied the boy's hands with a bathrobe strap so he wouldn't struggle. The concept of force was thrilling, he wrote. Dodd had no intention of suppressing his paedophilic inclinations, despite the repeated treatment sessions. Dodd even began to daydream about murdering his victims. He said, The more I thought about it, the more exciting the idea of murder sounded. I planned many ways to kill a boy. Then I started thinking of torture, castration, and even cannibalism. Although he claimed that he decided to murder in order to keep himself from going to jail, this is difficult to believe when we consider that he was hardly prosecuted for any of his crimes. Later, Dodd would brag about how simple it was to fool the judicial system and avoid going to jail. 
Dodd wanted to kill children because he was a sexual sadist who was enthralled by the power he had over their pain and death. It wasn't until a year later when Dodd chose the first child he would murder. The victim would be an eight-year-old boy he met while working as a security guard for a construction site. On his day off, he drove to where the boy lived, hoping to lure him into one of the vacant buildings nearby. Then he planned to take the child to an isolated wooded area where he would kill him. But the boy sensed that his new friend was dangerous. After Dodd asked him to help find a lost little boy, the eight-year-old said that he was going home to get some toys for the lost boy and promised that he would be right back. Instead, he stayed inside and his mother called the police. Convicted on a misdemeanor count of attempted unlawful imprisonment, he was released in October with yet another order for psychiatric treatment. Dodd went through the motions until his probation expired in the fall of 1988, at which time he promptly abandoned his therapy and went back on the hunt. By that time, he had started to collect his morbid daydreams in a diary, complete with discussions of planned rapes and murders, sketches of a torture rack he planned to build, and details of a private pact with Satan to assist him in obtaining victims. Dodd would later tell authorities he wasn't serious about his bargain with the devil, but his writings would suggest otherwise. In one entry, David wrote, quote, I've now asked Satan to provide me a six to 10 year old boy to make love to, suck and fuck, play with, photograph, kill, and do my exploratory surgery on. Yet another page detailed his search for compliant children who could be taught Lucifer's ways and be an assistant to Lucifer, quote, through me, end quote. Whatever his religious bent, by the late summer of 1989, Dodd clearly had murder on his mind. He was armed with a six-inch knife on Labor Day, September 4, when he went prowling in Vancouver's David Douglas Park. The night before that hunting trip, he wrote, If I can get home, I'll have more time for various types of rather than just one quickie before murder. That night, he set his sights on brothers 11-year-old Cole Near and 10-year-old William. Taking the two of them home was clearly out of the question, but Dodd bullied them into following him off the beaten track, deeper into some woods, where both boys were bound with shoelaces, sexually abused, and then stabbed to death. Escaping in the nick of time, Dodd fled the scene less than 15 minutes before a teenage hiker found the mutilated bodies and ran off to call police. Dodd spent the next few weeks watching Vancouver's manhunt from a distance, filling a scrapbook with press clippings, killing time with masturbation and his diary until the bloodlust drove him out to hunt again. On October 29, he drove across the river into nearby Portland, Oregon, and there, he abducted four-year-old Lee Isley from the playground of the Richmond Elementary School. Back at Dodd's apartment, the child was molested and photographed in the nude. His ordeal interrupted briefly by a trip to McDonald's and Kmart, where Dodd shelled out money for a toy. The sexual abuse resumed once they were back at his flat. The murder was complete at 5.30 the next morning, when Dodd choked his young victim unconscious finished the job with a rope, suspending Lee's body from a rod in the closet. After work that night, he dumped the body near Vancouver Lake at the Washington State Game Preserve, where a hunter discovered it early on November 1. Police still had no clues to the elusive killer's identity, beyond a rough sketch compiled from eyewitness descriptions in Portland, but Dodd had reached the point of no return by now. His homicidal urges pushed him beyond all rational control, acting like an animal. On November 11, he tried to abduct a young boy from Vancouver Theatre, but he quickly gave up when the child resisted, as there were too many people around. Two days later, after scribbling another plea to Satan for assistance, he drove to Camas, Washington, to try his luck at another theatre. The movie that was playing was Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, but Dodd was not there to enjoy it. 
Instead, he scoured the audience for his next victim in a methodical manner. He kept an eye on the little kid who was alone as he moved up the aisle towards the foyer. Dodd got out of his seat and followed the kid into the restroom without hesitation. Another six-year-old kid came into the lobby to use the restroom as well. Dodd smiled and told the six-year-old to go in first. Shortly thereafter, a child's desperate screaming broke the silence. The screams came from the men's room. Dodd came out of the bathroom, holding a screaming boy on his shoulder. According to the Oregonian, the young child was frantic. He screamed so loud three blocks could hear him. The staff all stood and watched as a young man with black hair and a big moustache carried the child out, twisted and writhing in agony. Calm down, son, he patted his back. Relax. It wasn't the first time a kid had a meltdown in their cinema, but the child's repeated pleas for help worried them. They chased Dodd along the dark street, who increased his grasp on the terrified youngster. He walked up to the car, fumbling for his keys and looked back, but James, six, managed to get free and ran as quickly as he could. James grabbed the leg of the theatre owner, who was following them and said, that man wanted to hurt me. Now their mission was to locate his mother. William Ray Graves, James's mother's boyfriend, heard a ruckus when the kid exited to use the toilets. He was enraged when he learned what almost occurred. Fire in my eyes, he stated afterward. Dodd was spotted in a mustard yellow Pinto wagon. Graves raced out into the dark streets, intending to pursue the vehicle on foot. Surprisingly, the Pinto station vehicle broke down in the middle of the road. Graves approached it carefully. He asked Dodd if he needed help in order not to scare him. Dodd cautiously accepted Graves' offer. When Graves had his opportunity, he grabbed a hold of Dodd and took him back to the theatre. You've been arrested, we'll call the cops, he said, restraining himself from attacking the assailant, even though he wanted to beat the life out of him. Graves sat with the murderer in the movie foyer until the cops came. Dodd just gazed at the floor. Now under arrest, Dodd, now 28, denied any participation in the recent deaths of two other youngsters, Cole Near, 10, and William Near, 11, who were discovered stabbed to death at the Vancouver Park, and Lee Isley, 4, who was found near Vancouver Lake, about 10 miles away. Authorities questioned Dodd when he said he worked at a paper mill approximately a mile from where Lee was found. In less than an hour of detention, in November 1989, Dodd confessed. But Dodd's confession was only the beginning of his savagery. The more that Dodd talked about injuring children, the more he appeared to relish it, as if his admissions were a chance to relive it. His torture rack, publications describing the atrocities, and other evidence were uncovered during the police search. In a suitcase beneath the bed was the most unsettling evidence. Dodd had photographs of kids in his suitcase, including one of his victims, Lee Isley. His journal shocked and saddened the community. Dodd was charged for the murders of William and Cole Near and Lee Isley at the New Liberty Theatre. Dodd first pleaded not guilty, but in January 1990, he altered his pleas to guilty on all charges. Later that year, he read a statement to a Clark County judge, admitting to all counts. He confessed to planning his crimes, including murder. No trial would be held to determine his guilt, but a jury would decide whether to execute him. The jury of six men and six women sat stunned, disgusted and saddened, as they read from Dodd's journal and viewed photographs of his brutality towards Lee Isley. The defense didn't call witnesses or offer evidence at trial. Defense counsel Lee Dane tried to imply Dodd was crazy for keeping journals. Dodd sat still during the trial. The testimony bore him, he told the Oregonian. I've heard it so many times, 
is becoming old. Prosecutors sought the death penalty, and on Saturday, July 15, 1990, the jury agreed. Dodd expressed regret as his execution date approached. I confess to all my crimes, he told a reporter. He said, I believe in heaven, as the Bible says. I have my reservations, but I'd like to think I could go up to the three small boys, embrace them, apologize, and love them with a genuine wish not to hurt them in any way. We can only hope that Dodd's last destination separated him from the boys he murdered. Good evening, I'm Annette Tyler, and here's what's coming up tonight at 11. In Washington State, the countdown continues for the execution of Wesley Allen Dodd. He could become the first person to die by hanging in the U.S. since 1965. He's scheduled to die just after midnight for the murders of three boys. Shortly after midnight on January 5, 1993, he was the first American inmate hanged in nearly three decades. If you found this story compelling, don't forget to like the video comment down below your take on it and subscribe to the channel. Also, hit that notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. And until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.